Good morning, everyone, and we welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. This morning is Sunday, May 21st, 2017. I'm going to start today with um, two prayers. I think we will be beginning our session with prayers. This one uh, is in our new Liberator, which is coming out, Love is the Liberator magazine. And it was sent to me by Bob in Colorado, and it's Mrs. Eddy's prayer at the Massachusetts Metaphysical College. Oh, my God, I offer as a consecrated gift upon thine altar a heart dedicated to thy service, lips speaking only words of charity, love, and truth. Thoughts striving to be only the true thoughts of the mind of God. Help me to endure unto the end, strong in the faith, powerful in the truth. All the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service. May heaven help consecrate, and accept. And then this is from Miscellaneous Writings, page 279. We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind, for then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind, as when the earth was without form and mind spake, and form appeared. Welcome. So this morning, our lesson subject is soul and body. <clears throat> Golden text, Psalms 23, 1 and 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul. So any comments on that or any part of the responsive reading? before we will go to science and health. Or any anything in the Bible part of this week's lesson. We yesterday we have a Bible study in the Bible study we um, talk about the Bible selections. Our lesson had the story of Jacob and Esau. So it was a very wonderful Bible study and thank you, Amanda. We have four visitors today, so from New Hampshire. Robin and Ralph and Carol and John, and we welcome them. So any comment, Tom? Well, this particular psalm is probably the first thing I ever learned in Sunday school at the uh, ripe old age of three or four, whatever. And I remember, I think the first healing I ever rem I remember, I, I was about that age, and I was sick to my stomach. And I remember praying this song, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it actually meant something to me at the time. And what it meant to me was, I shall never be without anything that I need. I shall not, I, I'll never be lacking, whether it's health or harmony or anything else. possible for me to lack anything because God is my shepherd. And uh, that little bit of truth that I understood as a child healed me in about three minutes of the stomach, whatever it was, flu or whatever. And I never forgot it. And as I was growing up as a older child, uh, and the world started telling me that something other than Christian science was true, that healing, plus other things that I learned in Sunday school, uh, helped, me, helped me see what was true and what was not true. Um, so anyway, this song has a special spot in my heart. Anyone 
child? What does the word restore me? Bring to its rightful place. Thank you. Bring to its original condition. Yes. And your soul? I know one of the, I think in the Amplified version, which I sometimes like to look at, when it mentions soul, it talks about your inner being. So when you're feeling, you know, like your flame is going out, your inspiration is going out, you can know that it is God who restores your soul, brings it back to its original being. Anyone else? And, and how does that happen? <laughs> well, why is it that God always brings us back to our original being? Right, that's what we do. But what's the principle behind the healing? Well, God is our source. We are never away from that perfect place, but we have to be brought back to the view, the right, correct view, that we are always there. That's Yeah, God brings us back to our original being because he is our being. That is why it works. There never was a separation, except perhaps in our own thinking. Now we are just focusing back to the original, getting our focus correct. And then I love this in the responsive reading. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. To me, that unites this thought of soul and body. So what is Mrs. Eddy's definition of temple in the glossary? Does anyone remember any of it, the first part of it? What does she say your temple is? Body. <laughs> body. And I always do body as a body of right ideas. Thank you. Yes, she says that. She says the body is the embodiment of right ideas. Watch your thoughts, not your body. It's a beautiful thought because when I think of the word temple sometimes, I mean, literally it means a place where people go to worship. But we are the temple of the living God. What is it that's flowing into us that makes us his temple? All of his right ideas, every one of his angel thoughts, come into us from him and it forms us as his image and likeness and expression. Thank you. That, that connects you with the second part, the spirit of God dwelling in you. So Mrs. Eddy first part of her definition, temple, body, the idea of life, substance, and intelligence, the superstructure of truth, the shrine of love. So from now on, whenever you think of your body, you think of it in this way. You are the temple of the living God. You are the shrine of truth. These are, excuse me, the superstructure of truth. Structure. Building. Something that we can see and use. I think this is why <clears throat> the idea that you are church, we are church, that structure of truth and love is so beautiful to entertain. And the structure of truth and love. Yes. Yeah, it's not just a building, is it? If it doesn't stand for something right, what's the point? There's a passage somewhere in Glenn's writings or it was pointed out to me by a practitioner, and it, it says something 
like this. This is not an exact quote. My body is God's laws and their harmonious operation. That's something that I have used many times to keep getting on the wrong track. Thank you. That's a good point, because ultimately, body is the manifestation of God. How could it be anything else? If God is all, can there be anything other than God or his manifestation? Now, and the problems that we have that force us to get back to God tend to be the result of thinking that our body or our self is something other than that and accepting belief that it's something other than that. Of course, mankind has a lot of beliefs that your body is something other than that. And a lot of mankind thinks that they comprise laws, laws of medicine or laws of biology or laws of whatever. What's interesting is so many of these so-called laws constantly changing. So they aren't laws. Constantly changing, not substance. Certainly not true. Truth is absolute. These kinds of things that I hang on to or try to hang yeah. All the human laws are changing. Can everyone hear everyone? Okay. Sometimes, but not all times. Not all times. Okay. Speak up. Okay. All the <laughs> so it's asking a question. So when you have trouble with yourself, you can say, Mary. Know you not <laughs> that your body is the temple of the living God? Don't you know that? Obviously not if it's giving me trouble. So I need to get back to knowing that. And as all these things that were spoken, as John and Ralph said, the laws, the laws of the universe operating within us. These are laws of the universe. Christian science is not a religion. It is the laws and principles of the universe. People all over the world demonstrate it. Some never reading the Bible. We have no hold on it. How could we? The expression of God is infinite. And then the second part, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Mary, don't you know that? That the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So if you're feeling depressed, negative, anxious, Aren't you knowing that the Spirit of God dwells within you? And if you're not, why not? And you better. And I love this. This is from the Amplified Version again. And it's referring to Philippians 4, which is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But it certainly applies here. And the Amplified Version says, I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength in me, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. You get up every morning and you think that to yourself. I'm sure your day will be great. You're ready for anything and equal to anything. Through him, through God, he's infusing you, as, as Bruce said. His spirit is within you. The liveliness, the joy, the completeness, the peace, all the things that God is, you are. And don't forget it. I'm asking you the question. Don't you know this? There's a book called um, Search for God, and I don't remember the author, but I think it was a Christian scientist. And one little sentence spoke to me so clearly and strongly along these lines. I am God manifest. You are God manifest. Yeah. That's the truth. That's yeah. where you start. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing, um, you know, we were given by Mrs. Evans years ago. There was a, a quote in Science and Health, 
and she went to her practitioner's office, and I can't, I don't know the quote by heart, but it's something in science and practice. Well, anyway, so, oh. and he asked her if, if she knew what it meant, and, and she didn't really, but what he said was, you are not God, but God manifests himself through you. And that is a powerful statement. She said she left that office on wings. Something about infinite individuality. Yeah. You know, I can look it up, but anyway, infinite individuality. Yeah. So, anyway, you are not God, but God manifests himself in you. Of course, you have to let him, and you have to be obedient to him, um, because there's a fallacy where people go around and say, I am a child of God, but they are not acting like a child of God, and that brings on... Um, uh, great, great disappointment. Right, and and also it, it does Christian Science a great disservice. Great disservice. Okay, <clears throat> if there's no more anyone would like to say about the Bible, and as I well, said, you can you can read or listen to our Bible study. Well, this the same thing goes on through Corinthians here, because. He says, for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. I always thought that this was kind of a strange part of Corinthians. To be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, being clothed upon, we shall not be found naked. I used to just kind of skip over that. But I think it means, but it, it meant something to me this week be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. What is that referring to? I think in what Mary read from Mr. Bay's definition of temple, that we're the superstructure of truth. The superstructure of a building is really just the framework of it. So everything else is what we're being clothed with. And everything else is love and soul and of God. Yeah. I mean, what, how did Jesus equip his disciples to heal? He gave them the truth. And they stuck, they finally, eventually, stuck with the truth. We're being given the truth here. And if we, if we earnestly desire the truth, it will clothe us. We won't be naked. Because if we wander around in this world without truth in our heart, you're, you're going to be subject to every whim and defenseless. you're defenseless. The truth is the armor, not in the of love. Thank you. Yeah. So if we don't strive to take on this truth, you know, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be taken from us. And make it in want, vulnerable, you know, cold. Clothing is, is what yes defends, protects the truth, the armor of truth. But we have to desire it earnestly. Hmm. What I sometimes see, sometimes feel myself is, you know, I don't want to work so hard to keep this truth. There are a lot of people around us who show no interest in it. And we can't let that discourage us or influence us. Keep us from earnestly desiring to know the truth, to live it. It's our only defense. Nothing else really matters. And perhaps that is the most important step in getting this truth is the earnest desire for it. To, as, as the psalmist said, to have your heart pant after it. To have it the one desire of your heart, as in Psalm 27. You've got to want it more than anything else. And if you don't, then don't give lip service to it. 
again, you do Christian science, great disservice. It's got to be you're all willing to give it all. And if you do, God says, you seek me with your whole heart, soul, mind. I will be found of you. That has to be the love of it that goes with truth always. Truth and love. Yes, and that, thank you. Because in body, the definition, the shrine of love, truth and love accompany each other. What is shrine? A sacred place, a special place. Where we keep things that are sacred. Yeah. So is your heart a shrine? Truth? What God what God is? Or is your heart a shrine for something else? Because if it is, we're just deceiving ourselves. But if these things, if you allow these things if you allow yourself to be this expression of God, God expressing himself, you are the superstructure of truth. The laws, as John said, the laws are in you, operating. And that love is in you, operating. Many people, and I used to feel it too, maybe, that I wasn't loving enough. Well, I am not loving enough. But as God, when God expresses himself through me, that's a different story. the divine love that heals. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go to science and health. Um, citation three. Linda, you wrote about that on the forum, so maybe you can read it and then tell us. Soul or spirit signifies deity and nothing else. Heathen mythology and Jewish theology perpetuated the fallacy that intelligence, soul, and life can be in matter, and idolatry and ritualism are the outcome of all man-made beliefs. The science of Christianity comes with fan in hand to separate the chaff from the wheat. Science will declare God of right and Christianity will demonstrate this declaration and its divine principle, making mankind better physically, morally, and spiritually. Thank you. And then you wrote on the forum, that's our website forum, um, science will declare God a right. Yes, and to me that was the book Science and Health is declaring the science. And then we had discussed the importance of taking time every day to read from the science and health. And then I came across a letter that Mrs. Eddy wrote in 1891 that said, and she was referring to her revised edition, but for me it was for any edition that you read, quote, in reading my revised edition five, that is, by the way, published this week, there is no special direction requisite. The general rule is to commence with the first chapter, read slowly, and pause as you read to apply certain portions which meet your present need to thought that will carry them out in action. The book is complete in itself. It is teacher and healer. The labor I have bestowed on it you cannot reckon. There are more signs of it than you can see, but not more than will be felt." End quote. Wonderful. Thank you. Such good counsel as to how to study the textbook for Mrs. Benny. Yes. I loved it. And in here, we have been taught to, to read every day the Bible, Science and Health, Prose Works consecutively, a few pages each, or any way that God inspires you. And this, too, I turned to this morning in Miscellany 115, where Mrs. Eddy said, I should blush to write of science and health with key to the scriptures, as I have, 
were it of human origin, and were I apart from God its author. But as I was only a scribe, echoing the harmonies of heaven in divine metaphysics, I cannot be super modest in my estimate of the Christian science textbook. And that's where we stand. We are infinitely grateful to Mrs. Eddy for giving us this. And we do see it as the Word of God, and personally it's the Word of God as we do the Bible, as we do prose work. Why study of it is essential. That's why the thought of anybody feeling like they need to rewrite it to up, it or upgrade up, the language upgrade it, yep. or anything like that yep. is really stupid. <laughs> wow. Yes, it is. Because it, it misses the point. It also says that people are dumb. Can't understand That's true. It. Oh, well. well, it's a total human view of the science. And a human view of the science can never do anything right, as we have seen over and over again. And also, it's been my experience, unless you are living this, you will not understand it. You can't. This is if you were just to read a, a math book and never work out a problem. So people who think that they can merely study it without applying whatever tidbits they're getting from it, it's possible. And the more you live it, the more you will understand it. Because understanding is a result of obedience. You can't understand until you obey. You have to be willing. And that's where the faith and the trust comes in. Many people just won't trust God. They will sit and just read. But they don't live it. You've got to go out and live it whatever your understanding is. And this is where the books, the Carpenter book, um, Mary Baker Eddy, Her Spiritual Footsteps, Mary Baker Eddy, The Precepts, explains how she lived it. And that's why those books were uh, read Richard Oak, Concerning the Rights of Man. We will tell you how they did everything they could, and I'm talking about the organization at that time, to suppress those books and keep it from the hands of the people. Because in those books, you were instructed how to live the science, how Mrs. Eddy lived it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's invaluable. All the early workers, all the books that are deemed unauthorized by an organization, are essential in many ways to the further understanding of the science. It is true, science and health prose works in the Bible are it, but there are those who lived in her home who have first-hand experience who wrote. Carpenter, Martha Wilcox, Kimball, all of these people. And those books we offer for sale and also for download on our website so that others can understand the living of it. And she said it. She said it. You must know how to demonstrate it. It opens up. It opens up your reading of the textbook. Um, every and, and what did she say when someone asked her, what, what do you look for in a practitioner? Someone who knows her history and the history of the cause. Yeah. Yes. Someone who knows the history, her history, and the history of the cause. Because those, those, those were what she said the requirements were for a good practitioner. Which surprised me because I thought it would be, well, someone who was loving or this or that. But no, someone where who knew the history. Is it is. I know it's in precepts. Like we can find it after yeah. church if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank for you. For spiritual precepts, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure, too. Yeah. It was uh, with, with the map or something during that time when she was looking for a practitioner. But I'll find it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of things we remember from 40 years of boot camp in Christian science, <laughs> and going through the, the trial and everything else. Um, Coming out the other end. Yeah, much, so much, we remember, much, much but better. sometimes we don't always remember the source. But Linda is our, <laughs> our researcher, and Jeremy. 
many of these things are now on digital, so we can find them. So, okay. I just want to say real quick, I really liked what Linda read about, you know, pausing to use it because that's demanding the blessing. You know, pause to do it. We're not demanding anything. Well, what is so incredible is just one sentence from her textbook. One sentence can heal almost anything. It's amazing if you just take one sentence and use the one sentence. Because so often, and, and I find it in the practice, as this Florence, Florence is our other practitioner that you've heard her speak, um, people are always wanting more and more to read or study. Well, just to take the one truth and use that opens up tremendous, tremendous horizons, shall I say. You know, when we first started out and we first uh, were shocked by the law case against us, um, and then went through it and learned how to watch, which we never heard about watching, but we started watching. And then afterwards, we got the books, which explained the watching. We learned we were doing it, and we still do it daily and nightly, in unity and individually. Um, as we learned all this, as we progressed, as we learned how to handle the animal magnetism that was arrayed against us to stop this church, uh, first with the law, first with this law case, and then they they tried to sue us again because we were pr printing spiritual precepts, which probably would have bankrupt us, but we backed out of that because other people have been printing spiritual precepts by Carpenter. So after we came through all of these things, it brought us to a new place and a place in which we could rejoice of, of what we experienced because it, it required suffering, yes, but suffering out of it into to put you in a new place. Trials are proofs of God's care. And also what was revealed to us was were these books, which we did we did not know existed. Now I understand many Christian scientists in the organization know of them and read them, although my understanding is you were not supposed to. Originally when I told my practitioner years ago that I was reading something, she told me absolutely not. So anyway, all of these books, and, and I remember it was as if I had walked into a treasure room that I did not know existed. It was, and I some of the books I could not even put down reading them because they were telling of people's experience in Mrs. Eddy's home and what she, what they gained from that, and Carpenter particularly, and his his son. I mean, frankly, his life was was cut short by. Uh, his treatment uh, at that time, you have to read concerning the rights of man. And you will see everything they did to stop him. And it wasn't person, place, or thing. It was animal magnetism operating. That's all it was, and it still is, it always is, where, wherever you see it, within any organization, within our government, within the church, or anything else. Never person, place, or thing. Always something to stop the truth. And it can't be done. Well, it's interesting. Uh, when I was going through class, one of the participants asked the uh, teacher, was it, can we read books or articles that are not a book? He said, you can read anything you would like, but just be careful what you take out of it. He was saying, no, you're not locked into the cool literature of the church, but you can read any of these things. And I thought that was very helpful. Well, and that is very that's true. What, and that's what Mrs. Eddy told her students. Yeah. You read whatever, because you are the judge if it helps you or not. And to say that you can't is saying that you don't have the mind of Christ to discern what is right or wrong. It's control. And you see it in other religions where they can only read certain things. Certainly saw it in Nazi Germany <laughs> where there was bans on books. It's not a sign of progress, is it? It is not. You should be allowed to read whatever you want and, and let God tell you whether it's helpful or not helpful. I do find that what we have here 
in our church, I call it the creme de la creme of the books because they are, they are written by people who knew Mrs. Eddy or were taught by her or a student that was taught by her. And many of them have been excommunicated, which is interesting, like Eustace, like the Carpenters, like Kratzer. But they saw Mrs. Eddy correctly, and they caught a glimpse of the science Mrs. Eddy gave it. And they saw beyond any human organization what the science was all about and what it meant for mankind. And the human organization didn't like it, so it kicked them out. Uh, and, and I've never known that Mrs. Eddy ever excommunicated anyone or anything, despite all that was done to her. Is there any record of that? Not that I know of. Well, yeah. I'm trying to recall when I read the, uh, the two volume book about what it was brought up that at that time, the person in the New York church that was basically trying to control oh, the whole uh, church. Augusta, Augusta, Augusta. That's right. Yes. Augusta. Augusta. But I don't think she allowed the board to do it. She didn't excommunicate her herself. Right. She just allowed them to make the decision. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, she, yeah, she did. And that was only... She loved Augusta Stetson. She trusted Augusta Stetson. Mm -hmm. She yeah, saw what the board was doing, and she didn't interfere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good and right, it's right not long after she passed on. And uh, at that time, she said, it was like, you'll, you'll have to learn from your own mistakes. She's done all that she could to help. Um, and so, so, so it happened. And and even right after she passed on, they changed the manual. They changed the 88th manual, which was her manual, to the 89th. And they quietly put them in reading rooms without knowledge of most people. I certainly didn't know. I thought the 89th was the approved approved manual. And many other things transpired. And that is why. To know the history of our movement is so essential. So essential. Okay, let's get back to science and health. And the definition of Jacob at number six. Carol, would you read that? Jacob, a corporeal mortal embracing duplicity, repentance, sensualism. Inspiration, the revelation of science in which the so-called material senses yield to the spiritual sense of life and love. Thank you. And can you find what Parthens, so Parthens, Bob, Bob. Or, <laughs> and Bob. you were going to ask for what? Good old Parthens. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, Parthen writes, as with so many terms in her glossary, Mrs. Eddy describes Jacob as having two opposite meanings one derived from sense and the other from soul. With his estranged twin brother pursuing him to avenge a wrong done to him years before, it was Jacob's darkest hour. Yet it was as though Jacob knew better than to regard an external twin as the problem. Instead, it was time to immolate his own mortal, sense-derived selfhood, insisting on its own reality, badgering him like an evil twin at his side holding tireless watch bent on gaining supremacy over Jacob's true spiritual identity. On a practical level, this story is a wake-up call for me to allow neither whisper nor roar derived from the five tricksters, the corporeal senses, to deter my footsteps up the mount of spiritual attainment, but rather to wrestle down and overthrow the mortal self that Jesus called out as a liar and the father of lies. And he quotes from miscellaneous writing, quote, Be of good cheer. The warfare with oneself is grand. It gives one plenty of employment, and the divine principle worketh with you. And obedience crowns persistent effort with everlasting victory, end quote. Thank you. I never thought of an evil twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he makes a good point, and it certainly, I think it kind of, um, captures what we talked about yesterday. You struggle 
and, and maybe go back to last week when we talked about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Yeah. Hyde. You struggle with those things in you uh, that aren't godlike, and but you've got to fully master them and root them out in order for the new birth. Um, this is Eddie in prose works, new birth, and certainly pond and purpose speaks of that. She talks about the vile man within. I remember I used to think, oh, that's horrible, but it is. I mean, your human personality is, is vile, and it's got an evil twin brother. <laughs> but your individual identity is of God, and it's truly the only, the only truth about you is that. And we discussed that very well last week in our roundtable. Are you the one that wrote that you can't just cut the weeds off at the top? I don't know where I read that. I thought it was one of your posts, but maybe not. But I really thought that was helpful was this idea that you can't just mask it or try to fix the outward stuff. Um, you, have to, you have to pull it by the root, yeah. Because yeah. I know I've done a lot of weeds, I mean, just on the top, and they keep coming back. Well, you're a dandelion. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that goes back to, again, Mrs. Eddy's article, Fidelity, and I, maybe that's what you're referring to, what yeah. she says about the witch Perhaps. And that you it, yeah, it's got to be pulled out. Yeah, if you read that last Yeah, week. you might have had me read yeah. it, but somehow. Yeah, and you have got to pull, oh, stupid gardener, she says. You've got to pull it up by the roots. <laughs> I love that. Oh, stupid gardener. <clears throat> anyway, so we must not be stupid gardeners. Or else it'll choke the clover. That's, thank you. That's the quote. It will choke the clover. Oh, I know. It was in a watch message. Yeah, it was a watch message. It, it just occurred message. to me it was a watch. Yeah. Three times a week we have Unity Watch. Tuesday night and Saturday nights we pray for the coming service and for the cause of science to prosper. And then Thursday night we pray for some world condition. And uh, we have people around the country that join us. And then we each have individual watches during the day, or those who choose to. Again, those are books. The organization did not let out. Watches, prayers, and arguments. Carpenter, which will explain thoroughly watching, how to do a watch, watch messages, watch arguments, watch prayers. Uh, essential, Mrs. Eddy said, it was essential for the prosperity of Christian science. So why then were those books suppressed? Why was that? Except the workings of animal magnetism. If you have any other answer, I would love to know, but I don't know what it is. Those books are essential. You get it. If you don't have it, you get it today or you download it. Watch you download prayers, them. arguments. Isn't that also available through the bookmark? The bookmark offers many mm -hmm. things. I, I have many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The ones we took to our church and they said they, they had doubles. So couldn't so give them back to us. Yeah, so that they weren't authorized, I believe. Right. They, uh, and is watching disputing? Watching is similar to prayer, it's but prayer. yes, which you are declaring and you are working on a specific, it's not on yourself, it is a specific unselfish prayer. And Mrs. Eddy said, for our cause, yes, we go through our cause, our community, our, well, well no, that's, that's not, a prayer. Not special. No, not sure. watch. Oh. We, we watch. We watch sometimes for our youth, yes, yeah. but not not specifically our own children, but our youth. And the watch also handles the animal magnetism. It directly confronts it, and that makes it a watch. And he explains it in the front of the book, and our website has a whole section on watching, too, you can go to. And Mrs. Eddy trained people in her household to watch, and they, yeah, they did watches every day in her household, and she insisted that every Christian scientist and every Christian science church watch, that that would be saving of mankind. And it wasn't very long after she left that, World War One, all kinds of things. that nobody knew what a watch was and nobody did watch it. We, we would not have come through the uh, law case, the trial, successfully if we had not watched. And we had through the night we watched. We Our phones were going off all night long. You know, we, Gary had a two to three watch. I had a three to four watch in the middle of the night, just as she did in, in her home. 
and and it should be done just as earnestly now if you want to look at world events. And what it, what are we told? What are we told that Christian Science is expresses the state of the world. When the scientists are asleep, so goes the world. We are the underbelly. Because I don't know, Christians pray, and I God bless, I am totally supportive of all Christians everywhere and their prayers. But Christian science is the ultimate revelation because it's teaching you the unreality of matter. I don't know of other Christian churches that do that. And also the workings of evil and how to handle it. I don't know of other churches that do that, not to the degree that science does. Therefore, the fact that people are not watching and they are not praying, in my humble opinion, is unconscionable as a Christian scientist. But many people don't know, and they're just ignorant to it. We started watching because we felt the attack. We, we were under a huge attack. And it was, it was after we started watching that we were given uh, Carpenter's book, Mrs. Eddie, Her Spiritual Footsteps, in which she explained how to watch and why to watch. And the fact that watches were being done around the clock in her household for the cause of Christian science. And we thought, thank God we were given this, because we had no idea that watching was as important as Mrs. Eddie said it was in her time. We just felt we needed to. Well, we now understand that we have a responsibility. We, we know, we have a glimpse of the science. We know what the world needs. And if we don't watch, we are, you know, we... we <laughs> Well, the alertness we have a, alertness to duty, you know it? Be made to forget or neglect our duty to God, our leader, and to mankind. By their works, they will be judged and justified or condemned. Is it appropriate to share something at this point, experience? Sure. Because it, it sort of touches on watching. I have a cousin that lives in Chicago. He's a member of a Protestant church, and it's a group of Protestant church that maintains a prayer group. And her son was in Afghanistan, and he was going to be going out on a boat patrol. He called his mother and said, would you please ask your group to pray for us because we're going out next week on a patrol that I have a very bad feeling. Well, they pray about this around the clock. I don't know how they pray, but they do. He went out on the patrol. They were hit by a uh, landmine. No one was hurt. At time and time again, and, and those, absolutely, many of the Christian churches are doing far more than the so-called Christian scientists in that respect. They understand the power of prayer, and they are using it and working with it. Absolutely true. And we know... Someone told me, I had a wonderful call this week, someone in Australia, someone new, who had spent several years in Africa and talked about the enthusiasm and, and the love for God and Christianity and how they were working and praying, and, and uh, she was able to share some science with them. And so, highly important, yes, everywhere, power of prayer. Thank you. God answers righteous prayer. You don't have to be a Christian scientist to be able to pray righteously for heaven's sake. <laughs> Absolutely. But Christian science teaches us how to handle the animal magnetism. And it does it better than any other text, any other science, or any other theory. And, and if, once you know how to handle it, it's a responsibility that we have for the world. And, uh, you know, the, what Mrs. Eddie wrote, you know, if we in this class, you know, could bring in the millennium, if, if, yeah. if <laughs> we are of one mind, we're the capital M. 
to and vote. And why not? I mean, we have no quarrel between my brethren and my brethren. We just want the science out. I mean, you know, I don't know ultimately why we were excommunicated, except that it was... Uh, except that it made us much, much better. It did. It gave us such a clear in, clear Freedom. view as to what the science is and, and how animal magnetism works to oppose the science. Which we never would have known if we hadn't had this experience. So, well, normally we have more participation, so thank you all for listening to us. <laughs> I'll have um, Gary, and this is from Soul and Body by Peter V. Roth. It's an article, short article, Soul and Body by Peter V. Roth. It is on our carousel, and it sums up this lesson very well. By Peter V. Roth. <clears throat> You want to know how mind can rectify bodily conditions. This is easy enough to understand when you recognize that you are mental throughout. You may try to separate yourself into soul and body, ascribing all intelligence to soul and none to body. But the fact is, soul and body are one. They are both mental. Body is the part of soul, or to use the new word, consciousness, which is cognizable to material sense. But it is mental. This is why it talks to you so much. Stop regarding yourself as both soul and body. Stop using the expression body at all, if you like, and regard yourself as consciousness then it is plain why a change in your thinking will result in a change in what you have been calling body. For body is part of consciousness. Get the fear out of mentality, therefore, and you get the wobbles out of body. <laughs> <laughs> so, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. We all better know that, okay? So... We'll have a wonderful service. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.